Hello, everyone, and welcome to Win, a show where we interview champions and trailblazers and ask questions to uncover and discover their championship traits for succeeding in sports, work, and life. Win is part of Grit, a PivotalMomentsMedia.com channel focused on breaking the stigma surrounding mental fitness and sports. Visit PivotalMomentsMedia.com for more episodes, content, and education on how we can tackle that challenge together. I'm Lee Elias with JB Spizo, and we are joined today by national, international, and Olympic figure skater and coach Christy Kroll. Born and raised in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Christy was the 1962 U.S. Junior Ladies Champion and the 1963 and 65 U.S. Silver Medalist. She also had the privilege to represent the United States at the 1964 Winter Olympic Games in Innsbruck, Austria. And when her skating career concluded, she turned to coaching, forging a 49 plus year profession. From 1996 to 2002, Christy was the Senior Director of Athletic Programs for the U.S. Figure Skating and a team leader for the United States delegation at the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah. Christy coached in three Olympic Games total, and her list of elite skaters is a long and talented one, including two-time world champion Patrick Chan, international competitors Angela Wang, Agnes Zawatsky, and Andrew Torgashev, Junior Worlds Champions Joshua Ferris and Tomoki Huatashi, and Olympic competitors Liam Ferris and Vincent Joe. She also served as a consultant to Alyssa Liu and Karen Chen. Christy was the 2011 Professional Skaters Coach of the Year and inducted into the 2006 Colorado College and the 2012 Colorado Springs Sports Hall of Fame and continues to be a proponent for the sport both on and off the ice. That is one hell of a resume. Christy, welcome to win. Well, thank you. It's a joy and pleasure to be here. I'm honored. It's a joy and pleasure to have you. And again, as I said, your resume speaks for itself. For the listeners out there, this is an athlete, a coach, a Hall of Fame coach in every sense of the word. Uh, I'm excited to learn from you today and, and really dive into everything. And we'll start with this. You know, it's an interesting time we live in right now. You were one of the first coaches to really implement the use of computer software uh, to become tech savvy, as they say, right? This was a change in the old guard system then. We're seeing this across all sports from, from baseball to hockey with sabermetrics and analytics, uh, but it's becoming commonplace. Talk us through how that came about and how you kind of became a trailblazer with that technology. Well, it's kind of an interesting story because I really am not a computer geek at all. So the one thing I can do is operate the software called Dartfish. But, uh, you know, when an individual considers being successful, or a top achiever wants to do a great career path, you know, one of the key methods of trying to get better is what I call modeling. Um, that's what I think is someone fervently studying, analyzing, and applying yourself to the world's most successful structures, whether it be corporate business, engineering, or athletics. So there's always that model out there that you need to follow. So the perfect way for my coaching to really get better and get different was to fall into this great, wonderful thing called Dartfish. So thank goodness for advanced technology, because this is a product that I think that was irreplaceable for my coaching because it became immediate and specific feedback for my skaters. And it was a very positive influence on them. So let me just explain to you a little bit how Dartfish works. Sure. So uh, a skater is out on the ice and I'm off the ice. I have my camera and my computer and I have many files of the world's best athletes. And we can set up a situation where the skaters on the same trajectory as the world's best, take these videos, and then instantaneously the skater comes over and we can go either overlay, top, or side by side. And it's nothing like it because now the, it's a different way of coaching. The, the athlete's actually playing a game in the computer to see, oh, can I be faster than that? Can I be quicker than that? Can I keep my head better than that? So it exponentially also changes the learning curve of an athlete. It's no more guesswork. It's no more I think. It is. This is absolutely predictable and measurable what we're going to watch here. And when you're dealing with a really a advanced athlete, an Olympic athlete, not much is said as a coaching perspective because they'll stand back and take it in and say, can you play that one more time? Can, can I see that again? So their visual cueing then becomes what they feel internally, and then they do it and they they go and execute. So we call it the see it, feel it, do it kind of coaching expertise there. But the other thing that Dartfish can do, which is insane, 
is that we can slow this down into increments of 0 0.02, 0 0.08. And in elite sports today, whether it be baseball, golf, football, swimming, gymnastics, diving, on and on, these guys have the most unbelievable accelerating movement patterns that you can imagine. The rate of movement is uh, unbelievable. So in like the world of figure skating, from the time their feet leave the ice to their first tight position is 0.08. Wow. Now, what is 0 0.08? So we looked it up. <laughs> and it, it's lightning. Lightning wow. travels at 0 0.08. And so we can see it now. And we can't guess it. And the athlete can see it. And so to the first tight position, the absolute tightest position in these jumps is 0.216. So that's, that's interesting too, but I want you to blink. Okay, that took you four tenths of a second. <laughs> so right. faster, twice as fast as you can blink, they're in their absolute spinning rate. And interestingly enough, if they're not in that position by that moment, they can't rotate the jump no matter how high they go. So it's angular momentum going up that really achieves that. So, um, I was just very inspired to get involved with it because um, it was clear what was going on. It's clear with the athlete. It's clear with me. And at the end of every lesson that we would have, we could give them what they're going to work on specifically and what their, their goal is the next time I see them. And uh, no questions asked. You know, no more arguing. Oh, this is not what happened. This is not what I felt. Well, this is what I see. And then this is what I needed to go feel. So that's that's kind of what happens in a dart fist situation, wow. and uh, it's used widely all over the world in many sports. That's just uh, incredible, Christy. My first question to you is: After forty nine plus years of coaching, can you feel your feet, or are they permanently frozen? <laughs> so, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm the only person you know that wore a uh, snowsuit three hundred sixty five days a year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. That must be quite, quite the wardrobe. Yeah. Um, Christine, speaking to your colleagues, what stood out for me is that you, you're not the coach. It just says, you know, do it again. If a skater doesn't complete an element, you know, you take the time to understand the athlete, their technique, you compare it to the best in the world, like you said, and you give them that feedback. And I think it's so amazing because I, uh, the other thing I think people don't, the layman, I didn't understand until speaking with you, people don't understand that you know, you have the, you know, the European body, the Asian body, the American body, the Canadian body, like it, it all matters. Your, your body composition to what you're trying to, what you're trying to do, do a, you know, in the ice. Um, so, you know, Lee's a coach. Uh, I used to coach. And I think that this refinement is missed in coaching many times. Like what specifically does that particular athlete need? Um, like what led you to this training technique, your own upbringing when you grew up as a skater, or why are you so particular about that particular person, what they need? Well, uh, I think you really want the best for the athlete. They, it's not your journey. It's their journey. I mean, you'd so, hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, right. No, you'd um, hope so. Really good yeah. way of putting it, Lee. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind. So, uh, I left coaching for a very specific purpose, I was really getting burned out. I went and took a six and a half year hiatus with US figure skating. So when I came back to coaching, I didn't want to come back the way I was coaching. So I had this fabulous opportunity to meet Dartfish at the 2002 games and got to understand how incredibly precise and accurate this is going to be for coaching. So I had a big paradigm shift in my coaching to come back. But the cool thing is I didn't anymore think I was doing the right thing. I really, I knew I was doing the right thing. I, it was no question what we were doing. Now, today's kids are extremely visual. You know, from the time my two and a half year old grandson is, he's ahead of me on the computer. He can whip through it like you can't believe. So they're very, very visual. They learn differently and they have different bodies. So there's different adaptability. So the one thing that's very fascinating about elite athlete movement, no matter whether you are Chinese, Japanese, Russian, American, the elites all move the same rate, the same time, the same way. Oh, wow. So we have a platform now that says, this is the way you've got to move. This is no, there's no question. I don't want you to think that anything is different. So 
The good thing about dartfish is we have every body type you can imagine in this background of information I have. But so movement patterns are universal, measurable, and quantifiable. So that 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 gives me a lot of empowerment as a coach, right? I, I know what's going to have to happen to make this work. So it is a conundrum how you take this elusive strategy to make each athlete a little bit different. But our, we have always one objective in mind, and that's to get the optimum movement pattern for everybody that moves at the tempo and the required velocity and power that we just talked about. So it, you know, it's really all about that experience of getting it right all the time, all the time. And then that repetition of doing it all right. But as skating, I want to talk to you a little bit more about now, it's not just jumping or not just uh, spinning, but when you watch an event, you see the, the event from a spectator's point of view, they're skating to music, they have a theme, they have dynamics. So it's a passionate beauty. Um, they're, they're telling a story on ice. They they're, have elegance and grace and artistry on top of it, which just leads us into, I just want you to have some appreciation for the... Um, super maximal sport that skating is. So on an aerobic and anaerobic basis, they, they have a short program. So lots of scientific research done on this. That short program has the same heart rate, aerobic, anaerobic thresholds as an Olympic 400 meter race. The long program, aerobic, anaerobic heart rate, the same as the Olympic mile runner. So they're fit, number one. The strength in this sport is pretty incredible. So to get up high enough to do these jumps, you have to push up four times your body weight. Wow. But the, and the insanity is, at this rotating speed, you've got 200 pounds of centrifugal force on every inch of your body. So I'm strong, I'm agile, I'm proprioceptive. And then when you land, you weigh 10 times your body weight. So let's take a Nathan champ, Olympic champion. Well, he weighs around 146 pounds which means every single time he lands, he weighs 1,146 pounds. So they have to have the right proper technique or you're gonna wow. break. You're just gonna, you're gonna break. It's, it's not gonna happen. So clearly, um, I just wanted to always create this culture of clear and concise information to this athlete. So nothing was confusing. And then they're very receptive and they have a very positive experience. Um, they love to be compared with these elite athletes and they love to come back and show you that they've got something different going on. I mean, it's a, it's a great way to goal set. It's a great way to objectively see them. And um, we just, actually, you can just take the emotion out of training. Um, they're not volatile. They're not catastrophically upset. Um, they're happy people when you, when you coach this way. And that's what you want because then they're going to learn exponentially more. So um, just a, one other thing about this kind of training on ice, it's, it's not just on ice that they work, but they have a lot of off ice work that they do. So uh, kids are doing kickboxing, they're doing Pilates, they're doing jazz, they're doing ballet, they're doing acting. So it's a full time job. I think that's, that's the other thing about being an elite athlete. It's a day in and day out full time job. The, the best you can be. Christy, what's this spinning room that I hear that these skaters do? Can you explain that? I think that's fascinating. Yeah, we have a platform um, that is electronically geared that, that, that they can stand on. Now, they're going to stand on there. They're also going to be in a harness around their chest. And there is another coach in there that is in control of not only the spin rate of the platform, but once they get spinning to the rate they're going to be doing uh, on the ice, the coach lifts them up and they have to be able to achieve and hit this amazing spinning position. So a lot of this is trailing their myelon pathway of what they have to do when they get on the ice. So it's that, that reoccurring um, repetition, repetition of what it's right and what you have to do. And then the coaches that do that, they know their mistakes of these athletes off ice. So if they've got their head moving the wrong way or their hips are back or something, goofy then they say i want you to spin like you're spinning on the ice and then i can't i just can't spin so um they're they're into another situation where they are constantly uh getting the best instruction possible on what they have to do their movement has to happen to, for that spin rate to happen so that's so it. that so that's how they practice like their mind just going round and round so basically you're on a you're on a round table that the coaches 
is spinning. Yeah, the platform is spinning you and then you get lifted into the air and you spin with your skates on. Lee, we should try that as a little B-roll for, 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 for <laughs> when. See, just, see just if we could try that. You and see I visiting? Could, yeah. I think, that would be very humorous. <laughs> That, that, that it, it would just be uh, yeah two hockey players try the spin room that would go viral immediately you know yeah I I, I, tri <laughs> I trip I trip over the blue line when I'm skating so this 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 whole part of like leaving the ice and and doing all this Christy is fascinating and the other part which I think is so I mean think about like all the Olympic sports um, this is the only one that's like done in hair and makeup right everybody's everybody's in as you said full pageant mode both men and women, before they go out there. It's amazing. And they're doing things that you cannot imagine like right. how difficult that super maximal sport is. It is truly amazing. This is what I'll say, a few things, uh, Christy. One is that the Olympics are really any professional international level sport. I think people often take for granted the level at which these athletes are at because they make it look so easy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the key. And the thing is, and, and all the athletes listening to the show, coaches will understand this. What you're seeing is the end result of years, decades of training, right? And like in hockey, we always say we create muscle memory so that you don't really have to think too much in the game. And, and you know, I'm sure that, that you know, with, with figure skating, it's, I mean, you're, these, these men and women push themselves to the absolute limit and then continue to push that limit year after year after year. I was actually enjoy when they show the comparison of an Olympic 40 years ago to today, just to show the evolution yeah. um, of any sport, but whether it's figure skating, curling, anything in between, don't take for granted the amount of training, right. That goes into, to perfecting a craft. Now with that said, um, I'm finding everything you're saying fascinating. I'm a big believer in, in uh, technology as an assistance to coaching or not really as assistance as an asset, but I'll also be the first person to tell people that it's part of the equation. It's not the equation. Right. And I, I see a lot of, especially in team sports, coaches lose their mind in this stuff, spend 80, 90% of their time into statistics and odds. As, you know, baseball is a great example of this. And the human element starts to fall out of it. And it's very disturbing to me. When I coach, JB's the same way. The person is really the key. You work on the person, you're going to get a better player, right? You've already alluded to that. So with that said, figure skating is by far the most beautiful sport in the world. <laughs> it's the most watched during the winter games. Um, and we're hearing now that the minimum age requirements are going to be changed uh, from 17 years old um, uh, to 17 years old, excuse me, for the 26 games. Um, this past Olympics, we all saw the stress the Russian skaters had, uh, uh, particularly the, the 2022. So in your professional opinion, whether it's figure skating, hockey, soccer, basketball, anything in between, are we putting too much emphasis on these young athletes, they, they, their kids, to be great too early? Or are we going soft, right? And, and it's competition at the world level. So it's competition, right? But as you said in the beginning here, we want them to smile. We want them to have fun. Is it worth losing your youth to get a gold medal, right? I would toss that to you. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, speaking directly to the 2022 interesting email sport when the Russians were um, clearly caught doping and then clearly they didn't take them out of the sport. It was very um, distracting to the athletes that were there. It, had, right. it was nothing positive. And, and quite frankly, the Russians do dope. But... Uh, the other issue, talk about break. Have you ever seen a recurring Olympic Russian athlete? No. No. Um, they're, they, no. they're done. Mm -hmm. So they are made to be a machine, made to get out there and do their thing. And that's the end of their life. But we're, we're, we're Americans, right? We, we have a different perspective. We're Absolutely. sort of, um, I think, a renaissance kind of culture. We want our kids to understand athletics we want them to understand social we want them to have um, great education we want them to experience fellowship and friendship um, so my take on all of this is that um, I think the question really begs when you when do you train and when do you compete how do you learn how to train and then how do you learn how to compete and um, I I am of the ilk that says Stop, start training more when you're a little person, do more training, more skating, and less competing. 
A uh, prime example of that is the Williams sisters. They they mm -hmm. never right repeated until they were 16. And look, they're still going on today. That's so right. Yeah. Our, our our culture somehow says when you step when you decide to say I want to compete, then you say immediately I have to win. I'm going to win now, and if I don't win, I'm a complete failure. So I think that's that's something that a coach does. They really get in perspective for the parent. Um, they, they have more reflection on what are the goals and the goals have to be measurable and specific and current. And uh, so that, that is a huge secret um, to this whole thing. But the real, real bottom line, I think to all sports, is keeping them in the game longer, teaching them a lot of things as they grow up is how to learn to love your process, which means it's the day in and the day in out grind. Um, so I, I'm a great one for like to climb mountains. I get to live in Colorado and I get to climb up 14ers. But um, when you've done that kind of a thing, you walk up the mountain and you say, ah, I'm at the top. I've just summited. No, that's a fault from it. I'm really sorry to tell you that. that you are in uh, camp one and we're going to get some things organized here in this camp before we hit the next summit, which is another fault from it. But uh, the interesting thing about climbing a mountain is that the higher you go, the harder it gets, right? Mm -hmm. So tougher as you go, tougher as you get better and better. So I don't think we're beating kids up physically as much as we're beating them up emotionally. Because uh, the, the important thing is to have the little metal around your neck. And if you didn't get the little metal, it was a flop. So um, can I cannot tell you how important that is not to be a part of. So I'm just going to read you the Olympic creed, which puts it a little bit different perspective. It says, the most important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part. Just as the most important thing is life is not the triumph, but the struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered, but to have fought well. So this is this thing we're talking, uh, and you've got it on your hat, grit. There's something about that word that is every athlete, every person who's trying to be this high achiever, whether it be in business or in any kind of area they're going into, you have to have a certain kind of grit. And it's that no quit attitude. I'm not quitting here. I'm not giving up because I have it within myself to go and be this person that I want to be. But it all has to be done, I think, in very healthy, measurable terms. So that's my take. Well, the thing I always say to Christy is you have to define what is winning. Um, I think we have a convoluted sense of what I think people think that that's oh, mm -hmm. trophies and gold medals. And, and look, the truth is, well, that's what the kids want. Well, if that's what you tell them they want, then that's what they're going to want. You have to define winning and, and you can win in multiple ways in multiple situations. I love that you read the Olympic creed there, because I think a lot of people have just lost sight of the joy of com competition. Mm -hmm. I love to compete. I love it. Right. And whether I win or lose, I enjoy that journey. Right. Right. right? So, and, and that's, that's my win. Right. And, and I, I'm also a big subscriber to like, look, if I lose, I'm probably going to learn from it. Uh, sometimes that's harder to take in a championship scenario. That's harder to take than in a weekday event, but I'm, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to compete, to learn, to push my limits. Um, and I think on top of it, you bring up grit. Um, you know, the, it, it, it's funny again, just talk about the definition of winning. We know for, statistically grit is more prevalent in BC students than straight A students. <laughs> uh, we know it's more prevalent in people that have a horrendous upbringing, right? Um, people who have not quote unquote won by society's rules, right? Mm -hmm. So I just think that through your definition, through the Olympic creed, and what we're talking about today, we really need to take a look as a society at wh what are we defining as winning? And, and, and how is social media impacting this with human highlight reels everywhere, not re representative of real life and, and then the media we consume? And this is why I love sports is bringing this back in. This is why I love, you know, what we do here, because it's a vehicle for our growth as people. Mm hmm. And, th and that that is by far the most important aspect of sports. I said it earlier, you create good people, you're going to create better um, athletes. Um, final thing I'll say just before I toss it back to you guys. Uh, and, and I think this is a really important one is that, you know, when you dive into sports, when you think about the, the, the athletic journey, right? 
it is so important, as you said, to be mentally strong, to build that as well, and to understand, right, at the end of the day, that you have to love what you're doing. You are not the first coach uh, on here, but uh, you're, and I love that you're part of this kind of uh, community now. Uh, you're a top level coach who has worked with the top level athletes. And she has just said again, you must love this. You must love this sport and this journey to succeed. We have so many parents that listen. Well, my kid's going to do this. Does your kid love the play? Well, well, well. <laughs> like it's got to be there. There's no way you're going to succeed if you don't love that journey mentally, physically, and everything in between. So I just want to thank you for bringing that up again because it transcends sport. It doesn't matter who we're talking to on here. The top-level coaches, the top-level people are saying the same thing. You must have talent, obviously. You must have grit, but you must love what you're doing. I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, there was a couple of things here, Christy. I, um, and Lee, I'll bring it up for you too. Um, you know, Christy said she was a little bit burnt out. She took a hiatus, went to work for U.S. Figure Skating right. and then came back. But but she said, I came back a different coach. And I think that, you know, people think if like Bill Belichick or Nick Saban, they've evolved over life. Massively. Coaches, they've yeah. evolved. And people think, you know, maybe he gives the same answers at the press conference, but but these coaches <laughs> has evolved. And I think, Christy, you said that you're telling all these young coaches you got to continue to evolve. You got to understand who this, this new human is. Um, the other thing I thought was very important about, you know, particularly these, these Russian uh, uh, players, you said they, you know, they were one and done, get a gold medal. And then they go on to life. Uh, they, you know, they push these kids to they're mentally and physically exhausted. They push beyond like, them. They push, push beyond, beyond them. Yeah. Literally, literally, literally push them beyond. But, but, yeah. but, but think about that, that, that kid, that, that young, you know, that, that skater knows that this is a chance for me to, you know, hit, hit their own personal lottery, right? They get a gold medal. They're at a different status in, in, in their country. Um, but I think it's so important that you said practice more, compete less. Um, I love that. Lee, Lee, do you know the stat? I know there's a, there's a, um, um, us hockey, USA hockey stat about kids, 10 year olds that play triple a, yeah, you know, it's like 70% of them don't move on after that, right? Yeah. You push these kids to play single A, double A, triple A, and and it it's it's too much for them. Christy, I love that. Christy, uh, you you've been in this sport your entire life. Um, you've seen I've you've seen ups, you've seen down, you've seen the downs. What's your advice for coaches, uh, parents with kids in this high level program? Because I think managing the parents is probably uh, just as exhausting as maybe managing the athlete. Give give us some give us some advice. We we you know we have a child in some high level program. Uh, doesn't matter the sport. What do you tell us? Oh well, you know what? I, I love your win philosophy, but win is an, an acronym, and it means what's important now. And if you can get that through your head, that's good. I'm writing that down. <laughs> If you can live by that model, you can fix anything. So sports groom your life, right? Um, and because sports has ups and downs, it has achievements. Um, but the key becomes what's important now. And that and then that's translated into becoming what is resilient. And that is no matter what happens to you, you can reset, you can readjust, you can recover, you can move forward. That's that's life. That's right. the biggest life skill I think you can find. So that happens in a skating event. It happens in golf. It happens in anything. It doesn't matter what you just did before. The only thing that matters is what you're doing right now. And that's a hard one, uh, particularly in skating, when you're running around and you just missed your big quad toe and that's it. <laughs> There's right. no more coming off that to get down and get serious about what's happening next. So one of my students said, we always talk about resiliency. You got to get up and get going again. And he said, you need to tell me if I'm brilliantly resilient, I'm resilient. And I said, that's <laughs> it. That's it. You've got it. Because at that point, you start to believe in yourself, right? And um, being resilient, um, it's adaptability with a choice. Mm. You have a choice in there to be that change. So the first thing is, You've got to learn how to win. 
And uh, as parents go, one of the biggest things that's so imperative is what I call the silent trainer. So we have these athletes who are busy six, seven hours a day and very high capacity athletic movement, right? In every imaginable thing. But the silent trainer is rest and recovery. And that almost becomes more important than the activity you just did that day. Because if you're not rested and you're not recovered, you can't come out tomorrow and do the process again. So we really um, adhere to this huge rest and recovery for our athletes. You have to get nine hours of sleep a night, period. Because it's proven that after nine hours of sleep at night, uh, all that you've learned every day goes into your brain. I mean, it's, it goes in and you have this function. It's in, inside of you. You don't have to do anymore. It's, it's there. We've learned that nine hours of sleep gives your body time to recover. Mm. You even lose weight. You'll, you'll be less injury prone. So um, now we have kids going to school. They're still doing this high amount of athletics. And so the, when they come in, we have sort of a kind of a three question moment as you enter the rink with all these elite athletes. How well did you sleep last night? How do you feel physically? How do you feel mentally? And how hard can I push you? Wow, that's great. And, and so then if when you get those answers, honest answers from your athlete, then you can re readdress their training day so that they can be successful for whatever is given on that particular day. Let, let me ask you this real quick, Christy. How yeah. much has those those three questions changed from when you skated. Did you even get questions when no. you skated? Right? Like that's what that's, I, I want to bring that up because this is part of the evolution of sport, right? Yeah. The, the, I'm impressed that they're even asked those questions today, right? But when I was growing up, we didn't get, we didn't get anything, nothing. It's just, Hey, go, go harder. Like that. I don't care if you even slept last night. So I think that's fantastic and kind of proves the point uh, of optimal performance has many factors, right? One of them being, as you said, sleep, which which we actually talk about on the show more than not about how important that is, yeah. right? So so that's part of the evolution. I just had to kind of reiterate that because I I think some people think well that's normal. It's it's that that has not been the norm. <laughs> that is fairly new. Yeah, you can get um, programs on the computer that can register sleep during the night. Right. And uh, so many a time, my athletes have to show me their sleep for the night. Right. Hey, listen, yeah. listen, I behavior behavior at a cranky moment is has to do with sleep. I, I, just to equate this even further for, for everyone listening, this doesn't just apply to athletics, right? No. Hosting no. a podcast. I want to make sure that I'm well rested or it's going to come across. I don't want to be on here like this. Yeah. Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've got some Olympian here today. Like you don't want to do that, right? You gotta, you gotta find a way, um, to do that, uh, and, and again, that's uh, athletics, job, performance, anything, pre preparation, right, is part of the part of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everybody should have time limits on on, on their phone, Lee, uh, on their apps. Oh, yeah. You know, you should put you should put time limits on. I have it on my phone because it it, it just it becomes overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, the number of times you check your phone, hundred times a day, hundred fifty times a day, like it's ridiculous. I, I love that, that the phone's keeping me accountable now. It's like, do you know how long you're on your phone this week? Yeah, <laughs> it does exactly. that to me, like every Sunday. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to read this. Mm -hmm. I think there's another interesting phenomenon about this phone that you have this athlete that has just come on the ice, had an amazing lesson. You've given very all this going on in the lesson learning curve, and they're off the ice and they're in their phone. Right. They have forgotten everything. So most of my athletes, I hate to tell you, have an amnesia. And we have to start the lesson. Now, what did we work on yesterday? What do you know today? Blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, it's a horrible tool it, yeah. for a high-performing athlete. But I'll tell you this, too. One of the things, I'm very thankful for this. One of the things my father used to have me do um, when I was really, really training hard for hockey, and, and I'll admit, this is in the late 90s, early 2000s, so, so mobile devices are not, not there yet. Oh. Computers are, but and the internet is, but it's still kind of primitive. Um, but I still do this today. He would have me after practice, not just games, after practice, I'd write all the drills that we did. Mm -hmm. I'd write what I did good and what I did bad. Now, what, what's funny looking back on that now, I, I, I realize you know, it, it affirms how much I do love the sport that I played, right? Because I didn't have any problem doing that. I actually enjoyed writing it out, but man, did that stick in my mind when I was out there next time. And you're right. And, and just so everybody listening knows, JB, you know this, this goes up to the NHL. 
right? That, that, that coaches have had to make rules in the locker room of do not get on your phone and captains too. this point leading up to a game, this point after a game or practice. Um, not to mention, we've just gone through a two and a half, almost three year period where the phone was your default option because we were all locked inside our houses for so long. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. so now it's a trained behavior, but I, I want to reiterate, Christy, what you just said perfectly is that if you are, I might have you said again, if you are an elite athlete, this cannot be part of the mix uh, in terms of in a catastrophic way. No. And the other catastrophic thing here is that you read what's being said about you. Right. And that's the worst possible thing. So hundred uh, percent, just absolutely cannot get out on social media and listen to what's being said about you because right. it's going to not be anything that you want to hear. And these postings that go up after you've had a great skate, some people are horrified by your performance. Other people think you don't look right or, and it's just self-demeaning. And um, so staying out of social media so they right. can stay clear about what your goals are and who you are as a person. So um, I think one of the saddest things I ever saw in the Olympic Games was everybody uh, on their phone seeing how many likes they had that day, how many Oof. more likes they had. Like, and, like athletes saying that. So irrelevant. Like the, irrelevant. the athletes were saying that you're saying? Yeah. They, they, oh, want to, wow. they want to know how many followers they've got now. I would yeah. be smashing phones. So I, they, <laughs> I well, that, that'd have me out of there. Well, so it got to the point where um, you just really can't, we just don't allow them to come out. Once they enter the ring, yeah. they're in the bag, that's it. Look, I'll, I'll tell you too. The, the, in my experience, I'm, I'm the I'm the father of two young, beautiful children, about to be nine and six years old, and I'll just say this: I'm hyper aware of that, right? So they obviously are too young to have phones. Although I've seen kids their age with phones, but I'm very aware of that situation. So I have to believe if I'm aware, a lot of other parents of of kids that age are aware. So I do feel a shift will happen. Um, you know, there is a strong shouting night now for mental fitness, mental awareness, the, the perils of social media. So I do think a shift is coming with the coming generation, but uh, yeah, no, th- th- and it's, it's not these kids fault. It's not their fault that they're checking social media They're trained to do that by our societal walls or not trained not to do it. And that's why coaches come in, right? Cause mm-hmm. you know, this is where we come in as, as leaders or mentors of youth to explain that your self-worth is not a thumbs up on a device from someone you've never met. <laughs> your self-worth is what Christy's been saying this episode. How much grit do you have? How much resilience do you have? Do you love what you do? Are you willing to put the work in, right? That That's how you respond to adversity is that's who you are. I always mm-hmm. say, you really want to know who somebody is when they get knocked down or they fall down in the case of this episode, you missed your jump. Do you finish the program to the absolute best of your ability, knowing that it's over, as you said, knowing that, that, that is always the hardest part of watching Olympic or any kind of figure skating is when they've missed the drop, you know they're not going to probably survive that, but can they get up and continue to move forward, right? Because that's who they are. Yeah, and I think the 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 important thing um, that people have to understand about like Olympic figure skating uh, is, you know, if you're doing a ski run, you, you know, you get three chances. Right. Right. In Olympic, you get one, you get that's short it. program, long program, that's it. Like, so you don't have a chance to do, do it again. They're like, oh, this person will take out the lowest score on the, no, you know, the snowboard mogul right. thing that they're doing. Skating, that's it. You got one chance, you know, you screw it up and you're right. You, you go from first to 19th. But I have a good example from uh, Paul Wiley, who uh, was making his bid for the Olympic team. And, uh, he was like two tenths out of first of the holding place, and he was competing against a gentleman named Mark Mitchell. And one of the things that he did when he got off the ice was take his skates off and put his street clothes back on instantly, because he said, "No matter what happens here in this arena, I'm going to go on. Mm. I am, I am the same person I walked in as I am that I'm going to be walking out, and I'm going to prove to myself that that's a part of my life, but it's not my life." So. There's all kinds of ways you got to groom these athletes to, to accept this. You know, I did well today or I didn't do well today. But right. I think that's that, that mental prep you get going. So one of the other things I wanted to really address that parents can do um, is to create this culture. Is They could be the greatest cheerleaders in the world. If they would take that role and be like the chief operating officer around their child and, and think of it as a business, um, 
then it, it's a much more pleasant, I think, experience for their, their athletes to go through. And so what we do when we try to take these elite athletes, we do something called create a team around the team. And the team is the athlete and the mm -hmm. coach. But around that team, so in figure skating, we have a series of experts that all coordinate to make sure that, as I had say, no snowflake is unturned, that we really know all the components because um, we have equipment that's involved in this kind of sport. And uh, here's a real interesting thing about the Olympic sports, winter games only. Every single sport in the Winter Olympics has a piece of equipment that slides. Not so much in the other Olympic sports, but it's always about your equipment in the Olympic games. Winter that's Olympics. fair. Yeah, that's true. And so we have equipment problems and issues and how skates are made and what kind of blade you're using or in, you know, bobsled, how's that run going today? What kind of wax am I using on my ski? So you have that, that person, that expertise. Then you have a psychologist on board who's really ramping it up on how this kid thinks, uh, what's going in that head, um, other positive moments for them. Then you would have, of course, the seamstress the person who's outfitting them, then you're going to have uh, the, the spin coach, the stroking coach, the, the um, nutritionist. So there's a lot of moving parts around the successful athlete, but uh, treating it like a business. And I, I call the athlete, you incorporated. It's you incorporate when it's all about you. And so this incorporation has to have this protection around you, this circle, this great team that's forming around you that's Especially for you. So that's the way these, these high level skaters are being um, wow. groomed and brought up and, and because they can't function, I think, any other way than having that great team around them. I love the you incorporate thing. I also love that you brought up that uh, every winter Olympic sport has some sort of equipment. I, I, you know, I, I feel like I knew that, but I never actually put that together. You're absolutely right. Uh, and, and just speaking as a hockey player, yeah, it's very, very important because <laughs> it's, it's got to be perfect uh, at that level or you're going to have some problems. You know what I mean? So that, that was a great point. Um, Chris, I'm going to throw in one, a little, one, one more kind of additional thread to this question. Um, and you can kind of take this however you want, whether you want to take it from a youth sports level all the way up to an Olympic level. Um, I'm, I'm kind of taking the approach of more youth sports with the question, but I have met parents that have the approach of this. Yeah, look, it's important that they have fun. It's important that they care, but I need them to be competitive because I'm competitive and I'm just a competitive parent. And they kind of lean in, I call it the dark side, but they kind of lean in a little bit to like, well, we need them to be tough. I need, I need to toughen them up um, through the power of negative reinforcement. Um, I've seen this a lot where they go, yeah, but that kid wins because their parents are on top of them or that Someone's on top of them. Now, here's the, here's the paradox of it. There is a level of adversity that I do want my kid to face, but I see that adversity as a tool for him as a person, not as a hockey player. So if he's having a bad game or my daughter's having a bad game and they fall down and they're really upset, I kind of focus on what's the lesson I'm trying to teach her. Is it that you screwed up in the game and the team didn't win the game? Or is it, yeah, you fell down. And, you know, you have to get back up mm -hmm. so to me. That's kind of the tough side for me. Right. How do you approach that at the younger ages or how would you approach that at the younger ages? And, and what would you say to parents that kind of subscribe to that super tough love, almost robotic mentality because the kids quote unquote need it. Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? With oh that? yeah. What a, well, I'm going to, uh, since uh, I'm a figure skater, it's kind of a inside and outside edge, isn't it? It's just, it's, Wow. Um, that's a tough line. It's a tough road to hoe. Yeah. Um, if we all love our kids, to be fair, like I, I want to say, I, yeah. I, I, the parents that do this, I think they genuinely care. All oh. right. It, it's just hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you want the best. Absolutely. And uh, that's their right, I guess, as a parent too, and as a coach standing back. I guess that the only thing you can do is give them words of wisdom. And um, so there's, there are stages of development in athlete. The first thing you have to learn how to do is you have to learn the skill, right? Right. Okay. And then you have to learn to do the skill repetitively well. And then you have to learn how to compete. Okay. And after you've learned how to compete and that's all I've done, then you can learn how to win. Right. Um, so those are kind of the four stages. And somehow 
learning how to win becomes more important than learning how the skill goes. Right. So if you can balance that, that's, that's, so, and so, I, so I, I again. So, so I and I, I, yeah. I've done it wrong both ways. <laughs> yeah. There's no perfect parents. Like no. I've, I've made mistakes too. I want to say that. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not trying to be judgy here. I'm, just, I'm more trying to, to get the, you know, yeah. the thought process, but you said skill, skill repetitively, right? Right. And then compete and win. Yeah. Right? How to, how to learn. Well, right. first of all, learn how to have fun. Hey, they're not going to do this right. sport unless they're having fun. How to have right. fun, how to learn to do a skill repetitively. Then how do you learn to compete? And then you learn how to win. Well, and that's I, hard. I, that step between competition and winning is a tough one. I believe it. There's a lot and of I, pressure involved in that, right? I, 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 an immense amount. And if you're not mentally ready for it, you're not going to win. And, and, you know, JB kind of throwing this back to you a little bit here too. I, I, again, just reading that, you know, fun and skill, skill repetitively, compete and win. I'm just thinking about how backwards that is for a lot of people of winning is all that matters. You must compete, figure out the skills, and then you can have fun. I, I hear that more often than I want to admit. Yeah. You can't, you can't lift, yeah, you can't lift talent with anger and hate. Um, yeah. There needs to be some fire in the belly, Agreed. but you, yeah. but you can't, you can't lift talent with negative reinforcement. Sure. You're going to get on folks. Hey, come on. You're better than that. Like when you know, somebody's not, not competing hard or didn't prepare themselves for that day. That's the biggest one. You know, mm -hmm. player player comes in a locker room not prepared. Why? Because they were on their phone all night, or maybe <laughs> they had a, or maybe they had a few pops, or didn't get get some rest. They come in, so that's on them, and that's when the coach needs to say, "Hey, listen, right? Let, let let's go." But but you got to lift that talent, and that person has to find the talent. And well, yeah, I, I I think it's important. <clears throat> I think it's important that um, that. The parents understand that. I'll tell you a quick story, Lee and Christy. Uh, you know, my son uh, is a hockey director there in New York, um, and he coaches a, um, uh, you know, a 10-year-old a, a double-A team. And the parents are like, we need to go to this triple-A tournament. We need, And Marco's like, we do not need to go to this triple-A <laughs> tournament. We need to go. He's like, okay, you want to go to this triple-A tournament? And they went, and they got plastered. Right. And the parents were like, Wow. And he's like, I told, he's like, so yeah. what do we do? We just defeated all the kids. Yeah, we should, I'll find better double A teams for us to play, but there's no reason for these expectations to take a eight, nine year old or 10 year old. Yeah. And yeah. Say, Let, let's compete there. 15, 16, 17, different story. Yeah. And, you know, I always say this to JB and Christy that as coaches, right, you can't put the fire in someone's belly. We have to draw it out. Right. It's kind of there or it isn't. Now I'm not saying you stoke can't it. assist. Stoke, and, yeah. stoke the yeah. fire. Stoke you can help fire. to develop it. Right. But you don't create it as a coach. Right. You have to bring it to the, the forefront. Like to me, that's kind of coaching is really understanding a person on a personal level that can bring out the best version of themselves. And there's a lot of obviously tools and tactics to do that. Now, I'm not just talking mentally. Right. But but I think that's where a lot of people miss it of. um you know, well, why won't they compete? Well, that's not, I can't answer that. <laughs> we have to ask the person and, and understand where, where's the fire. It's probably in there. Right. Um, Christy, we're talking a lot. Did you, did you have any comments on that before I move on? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you live in a beautiful place. Garden of the gods is nearby. Uh, I've been told you have a nice flower garden. That being said, what techniques do you use to work on your mo own mental toughness and resilience? Um, you know, you've had a full career yeah, uh, you know, maybe even also, where were you? Where are you now? How has that evolved throughout your life? Oh wow! Well, um, yeah, I love that garden because it's almost like a little spiritual journey. Such right. pretty colors, that smells so good. Um, I just enjoy every bit out there. It's just a wave of refreshment. So, um, when you think about uh, the way this life goes, I sort of equate it to you're standing on the beach and you're watching the waves. There's a huge rush of wave coming in, but what's right behind that? That, that beautiful, peaceful wave. And so you have to find somewhere in your life. If you're going to fill others, you've got to be able to fill yourself uh, with good things um, that keep you motivated. Could be great music, but um, and beautiful sights. But the one thing, so we we with these elite elite athletes, we said, okay, we come in and we ask them three questions in the morning. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we close it down with three questions. And they're not really questions. They're three statements of gratitude. 
And so at the end of the day, these kids have to sit down and they write down three things that they're thankful for. Mm. And you, you'd be surprised. Maybe they'll say, oh, I had a complete turnaround in the middle of that uh, workout today. Oh, man, I, I came in feeling so bad and I totally recovered and did that. Or I just loved talking to so-and-so or something like that today. Or, or I appreciate my mom for bringing me lunch. Or so I think that's good for all of us, right? At the end right. of the day, three things you're grateful for. Because at the end of the year, you'd have more than a thousand things you've been grateful for. Then you've acknowledged the beauty, um, the peace, the competitiveness, the blessings that, that you have. And you have to incorporate that into your uh, life. So I have a fun thing to show you right here. I have something I'm happy for. <laughs> there he is. And he's trying to join this podcast. So I'm going to put him that, back It down. would not be the first cat to make an appearance on this <laughs> podcast, believe it or not. So that's cool. Bro, there she is. She'll, she'll, um, what's that cat's name? We'll tell the audience real quick. Oh, that's Oscar. 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 Mm -hmm. Oscar, Oscar was a surprise good. guest today on Win. That's Oscar. <laughs> Um, I think you try to find uh, fantastic books. One of the, the um, features I, I like to read is called Investment Business Daily. And it's a, it's a paper that comes out, but they have 10 secrets to success on this. And I don't have them right in front of me. But uh, the first one, the first thing to be successful is how you think is everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, And be aware of a negative environment because you have to be positive to move forward. So that, that is huge. And work hard, of course, and the results will be there. We all work hard, but you can't get to the top unless you're really gonna put out that effort to work very, very hard. So there's 10 beautiful uh, suggestions they have there. But, that, but in, the other thing is, um, I think everybody has to have faith in what they're doing. That faith it's gonna be a better day or faith that they're gonna make it to the top. But, you have to have, in my world, I have a belief in a higher power. So that keeps me going. I have a very profound belief in God and Jesus. And he says, that sustains me. But here is an interesting thing straight from the Bible, what faith is. And this is Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. And um, so... I would read those things to my athletes. You know, that would be something they had seen, for example. So I don't think there's one, one person that when you're going to do some big presentation or make a breakthrough, you are always wanting to know there's a confidence assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. And that has come from all of the process as we started out earlier in this conversation. The process is everything. And you're accountable for that process of getting to the top to all those different levels that we have. And um, so a prime example of this is Patrick Chan. So um, gets to the 2011 World Championships and I had worked with him oh, for probably two years, but uh, my little ministry was always handing kids scripture or handing them really great thoughts to think about, something they can memorize, something they can see. I mean, you, you have it in your locker room, yeah, hit that sign when you're walking out. Today, I'm going to be a champion. Be courageous. Um, so th those are those external things. But uh, so he, he had a Bible and he walked in the locker room. This is before the long program. Took his skates out, sat down and put this Bible over his head. And um, he went out and he started to warm up and he fell on every single jump in the warm up. Wow. <laughs> so you're like, okay. Well, so what does the coach do at that point? Well, a little humor coming in. And something was said like, well, you're getting that out of your system. <laughs> it's over. So um, uh, anyway, he, he went out and stated a flawless program. But I think he had faith that it was going to happen. We sure. talk on the show often of faith, however it manifests itself, whether sure. it's religion, science. I mean, there's a lot of things you can have faith in. Right. But at the end of the day, as you described, it's the belief in something larger than yourself. And that that things will happen as they're going to happen, mm -hmm. and and I think that the absence of that is a very scary place, um, you know, to not have that. I don't know how someone could compete in competitive sports oh. without some level of that. Um, the other thing you spoke of is mindfulness, right? The ability mm -hmm. to take a moment and just enjoy and be gracious with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, JB and I both every night before I go to bed, 
I just say thanks for certain things in my life every night. And it, and, and yeah. what's nice is it's become a habitual practice where I don't really even have to think about doing it too much anymore. It just kind of is part of my nightly ritual. Right. And when, when I'm doing it, I'm into it, right? I don't just say it to say it. Um, but what a wonderful way to end the day. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, you know, and again, you can get into this, you can get into it pretty deep. Like I'm very thankful it rained here yesterday. I'm very thankful that I'm a human being. I you know, that happened to be born on this planet at this time. There's lots of ways of looking at it. And as you said, if you allow, and this is a choice to a point for a lot of people, if you allow negativity in, that's a choice, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you have to make the choice not to allow that and to stand up. And that can be very hard, especially when the people you care about. Um, some of them, some of them could be parents, right? It's, it's very hard. But if you're feeling that, you know, take, take Christy's advice. You, you got to make that shift. You have to understand that and, uh, and, and find some faith right? Again, however it manifests for you, whatever's Absolutely. great for you and, and be appreciative of it. So yeah. uh, that's fantastic. JB, I'll let you have any closing remarks before I close it. But no, I think, I think it's wonderful. Uh, Christy, I noticed here in Las Vegas, um, I was at the rink and they had their big learn to skate going on and they probably had 100 and 120 kids in, in learn to skate. And I see that whether it's, uh, you know, boys or girls, you know, they're pushing them through learn to skate right into hockey. <laughs> uh, and and i even asked like i'm like you know what are the options for figure skating and it's like you know right in what hockey. what and, yeah. right and i don't know if that's because obviously you know for a rink th there's money in hockey right that's exactly. equipment, it's part of it yeah equipment that's probably probably part of it it's but a big part of it. um you know i i love watching the olympics because i want the u.s to win everything no, okay yeah. i want i want I want the U S to have 150 gold medals and everybody else have nothing. Yeah. Right? That's, that's all I am kind of a little bit old school. So no, you're Christy, a fan. You're a fan of the USA. I, I, am, I am. That's it. I'm going to take the Jersey here. I'm a fan too. So Christy, you know, in, in figure skating, um, obviously um, we have Nathan Chen who's, uh, who's phenomenal, but how do we, you know, how do we build this figure skating program where we can beat the Russians, beat the Japanese? I think the South Koreans are the kind of the big ones. Uh, even, you know, our northern, our nor northern America, Canada. What, what, what's the process? How do we get more kids into figure skating? Well, that's a, always a good question. I think U.S. figure skating is doing a tremendous job of offering different venues now. So in other words, uh, you can compete anywhere you want in the United States. And it's not based on that panel of picking you first, second, and third. It's based on your score. So that that's a good thing. So it's it's okay. going to show more impartiality, and it's going to show that you have skill sets and you can be rewarded for your skill sets. Um, I I think just the TV has a lot to do with the allure of how beautiful this sport is. Or uh, so a lot of people get involved in the sport that way. Uh, figure skating is notoriously expensive. So, and it's an individual sport. It's not a team sport at all. And I think that that's kind of the, the, the pull there. There's, there's two polar things going on. So um, I, I, I see U.S. figure skating coming in, doing more learn to skate. And now they have a bridge program now that takes them to another level. But I think, and um, it depends on where you are in the country. And if you don't have this amazing hockey team that Las Vegas has, you probably will be skimming off more skaters, figure skaters than you will to the, the hockey world. Got it. Yeah. So, but it's good. Girls can take, skate hockey too. And uh, yeah, no, what, yeah. Girls hockey, women's hockey is, is yeah, taking off hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, see, it, I think should, I see good things for figure skating. I think it's uh, developing to be a more uh, level playing field for a lot of people to get involved with. Yeah. And, uh, and I'd also imagine that at the younger ages, doing multiple sports is a is a good idea just to build yeah. skill sets. Correct, like correct. You know, it's really not that till. I mean, yeah, I think that's. I mean, again, it depends on the sport, but it's really not until you get to eleven or twelve for most sports that you have to really start thinking. Okay, how serious are we about this? Again, it might be a little younger in figure skating. I might not be, but you know, the the the, the having multiple experiences and seeing the things that you love. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to: Do you love this? Mm -hmm. Do you love that? I'm, 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 I'm going to hope that you haven't coached anybody that doesn't love it. Or if they, if they didn't love it, you were able to inspect that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So anyway, Christy, you've been fantastic. This was a great episode. I learned a lot, not just about figure skating, but just your approach is fantastic uh -huh. on an Olympic world-class level. That's a wonderful way to look at things. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Well, great. I surely, it was very fortunate and lucky and had a lot of great talents and, and a lot of fun. Well, I, it was for me too. And I'll tell you that, 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 uh, you know, I will be thankful for you tonight when I, when I do my <laughs> nightly affirmations well, and, you. You. uh, yes. the best part of this show is all the, all the education that I get just by being here with you and JB and it, it's phenomenal. So, okay. uh, JB, you good to go. You want to, yeah, thank you. Christy. Thanks thank so you much. Very that much. was, very nice. that was so, 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 so great. I loved it. I want to see Lee do a single axle though. Lee, can you, can I'll, you I'll try this? anything. Yeah. I just don't want to break. If, if Christy coaches me, I'll try it. That's what it was. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, we we're going to start off ice first, so you'll be okay. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I'm, look, I'm a great hockey skater. I, I'm very, very good on my edges, but I don't know how it transfers over to figure skating. But uh, if we don't get off here, JB is going to tell us about how he's a four time flag football champion. Four time flag football champion. I have champion. to hear it every episode, which, I love uh, it. yeah, yeah, he, he does too. So, anyway, Christy, thank you so much. That's going to do it for Bye. this episode of Win Championship Trades for Life. Again, we're powered by pivotalmomentsmedia.com. You can learn more about our organization, Pivotal Moments, and our channel Grit at that website. We've got a lot more inspirational, entertaining, and educational content. If you want to contact us, feel free to email me at lee at pivotalmomentsmedia.com or DM us through any of our Grit Athlete channels on social media. For Christy Call and JB Spizo, I'm Lee Elias. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure to keep an eye out for more episodes soon wherever podcasts can be heard. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Win. Thanks so much for listening to this edition of Win Championship Trades for Life. If you like what you heard, go ahead and hit that subscribe button or that like button wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, pivotalmomentsmedia.com. And remember, Win is part of Grit, a Pivotal Moments media channel, which is working to break the stigma surrounding mental fitness and sports. Again, visit pivotalmomentsmedia.com for more episodes, content, and education on how we can tackle that challenge together. Keep climbing, and we'll see you on the next episode.